Taylor, I completely forgot to ask you this. Is this going to be uh, recorded? It is recording even now. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. And we have Bertie County here. I know how to say it. Uh, if you could put your first and last name and your county in the chat box as you're coming in. We have 72 folks on the line right now. And uh, so many more coming, I hope. Uh, we had over 500 people register for this event, so we're very, very excited. Taylor, if you are on, can you let me know if uh, we are on Facebook right now? Still doing the descriptions. Okay, thank you, friend. Um, and we got Hertford County here in the house. That's really wonderful. So many buncombs here tonight. It's so great. Again, you're here for winning better early voting plans in 2020. We'll get started here in a few minutes. Uh, if you could put your first and last name in the chat box so we can see how many counties, uh, if you add your county next to your name, that's great. Seems like we have a lot of couples here tonight. That is wonderful. We appreciate you being here. Um, we'll be a light at the end of the tunnel. You probably have only been talking to your couple uh, for a very long time. So we're excited you could be here tonight. Mecklenburg, Chatham. Uh, hi, Manny Diaz. Uh, Manny is our Southeastern Regional Organizer. His name and number are in the chat box. He wants to work with you, especially if you're in the Southeast region. Uh, and we'll be starting here in a few minutes. Just let a few more people get online. Friends, I just want you to know you're the early birds catching the worm for winning better early voting plans in 2020. We'll get, be getting started soon. We had over 560 people register for tonight's uh, webinar. So we're gonna wait a few more minutes to see if we can't get a few more people on. And uh, because we can only hold 500 attendees, we are also broadcasting live on Facebook. You can find us at uh, facebook.com slash democracy North Carolina, all spelled out. Uh, if you wanna share with your friends and networks in case they can't register and get on tonight, um, you can do so now. Just open up a new tab in your computer, go to Facebook and share our Facebook live feed um, where everybody on your face box can listen to me talk to you directly. Um, and if you are coming online here, uh, we would love if you type in the chat box your first and last name and your county. And if you're from Charlotte, we know what county you're in, Mecklenburg. Uh, Kamaria Lawrence is from Charlotte. Uh, she is our Western Regional, uh, Western Piedmont Regional Organizer, and her email and number is in the chat box now. So if you're in the Charlotte area, you can contact Kamaria. She's great early voting advocate, and we need it in Mecklenburg County. All right. Some people have their precinct typing in. That is extra credit for tonight. But if you could give us your first and last name and your county, type it in in the chat box. I want to see if all 100 counties are represented. Um, that would be really cool. Uh, we'll get started here in a few minutes. I don't want to keep you too late. Uh, so we'll get started pretty soon when we have 170 people here now. Uh, we had 560 people register for tonight's webinar. And I'll tell you, that's a record. So we'll see how many show up for this great hour of power people power with winning better early voting plans in 2020. Hey, Sailor. Yeah. I checked the back end and Q&A wasn't enabled. Um, I don't know if editing it once it's already started would cause any sort of problems. Okay. Um, um, we, I, I was just going to mention we could take questions in the chat box since mm -hmm. we are downloading that. Cool. And uh, we'll do that here. So friends, we'll have a Q&A period at the conclusion of our webinar but I'd love it if you could type your first and last name and your county as you're coming in now. And we're gonna get started here in about 30 seconds. Um, and also throughout the night, if questions pop up in your mind and we don't answer them, which is very unlikely, we've got a great show for you tonight. Um, you can type in your questions into the chat box. And um, if you can see my screen, let me know you can do that. Um, that's gonna be pretty important for our presentation tonight. And um, I'm gonna 
make my view. Um, and we're getting some hands raised, some hope we can help people. Um, and just remember you are muted and um, your video is off. Uh, so we can't see you, we can see your name, but we'd love to hear your county and your uh, first and last name. And uh, if you have trouble, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box and we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to make the view presenters full screen and uh, get this party started with you. This is winning better early voting plans in 2020. Uh, it's our Zoom webinar. Welcome to it. This training is designed for election advocates like you who are ready and willing to organize in your county to win robust early voting sites, days, and hours for the 2020 general election currently scheduled for October 15th through Halloween, October 31st. That's the 17-day early voting period for the general election, with some counties already considering their 2020 general early voting plans. The time for this work is now, and so we're glad you're here tonight. My name is Sailor Jones, and I'm the Campaigns Director at Democracy North Carolina. With me tonight, an all-star cast uh, of our uh, resident election advocacy experts, starting with Alyssa Ellis, Democracy North Carolina's Advocacy Director, and Allison Riggs, the Interim Executive Director of Southern Coalition for Social Justice and the organization's Chief Counsel for Voting Rights. Our organizations have worked together tirelessly for years to fight for better early voting options in North Carolina, so we appreciate them being here. We've also been joined tonight by Caroline Fry, our Election Protection Manager, who many of you may know, who is leading up our election early voting advocacy efforts this summer. And Taylor Moss, my colleague and Democracy NC's digital associate. She's also here to help us with the all important role of taking and answering your burning questions. Now our organizations are nonpartisan, meaning this webinar is for people from all political affiliations or none who want to actively work to improve early voting options for their communities and counties. The more options to vote, the more all voters win, that's what we believe, and the more people who vote, the more our democracy wins. So the more people who fight for early voting, people like you, the more likely we are to win good early voting plans. And we'll talk more about the specifics of that in a moment. So in addition to our experts, I'm proud to say that over 560 Democracy North Carolina election advocates from counties all across North Carolina registered to attend tonight's event. We know some of you are here tonight. Uh, already are seasoned election advocates here to find out the latest on new election rules and the impacts of COVID-19 and others of you probably new to the early voting advocacy game who are beginning the work to organize around EV advocacy in your county. Regardless of whether you're seasoned or a newbie, we welcome all of you and thank you so much for stepping up in 2020. Now before we get started, I just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about some aspects of the Zoom tool that we will need for you to know tonight so that we can all have a smooth experience on the webinar. Some of you are probably way too familiar with Zoom at this point, uh, especially the meetings, but we're using the Zoom webinar, which means that all of you should be in view only and listen only mode. That means you should be on mute and have your video off, uh, but you should be able to see the slides I share with you on the screen throughout the webinar and hear me and my colleagues uh, either through the speakers on your computer or by dialing in by phone. If you can hear me well through your computer, that's absolutely great. Do not change a thing. I recommend using headphones if you have them and if you are listening through the computer, but the sound quality is not so great. You can continue watching your screen, but get the audio by dialing in with a phone using the phone call in and participant code info provided in the confirmation email. Now, if you have questions during the webinar, please jot them down in our chat box and we'll do our best to answer them before or during the Q&A period set aside at the conclusion of tonight's webinar. We are also recording this webinar and we'll send that to all of you after the webinar is complete. So don't worry, you don't have to take copious notes, although we really like that. Uh, you're gonna get the recording and audio 
uh, and video of this uh, because we have so many folks on the webinar tonight. We may not be able to answer all of your questions, but don't fret, we'll email you with answers from tonight's most frequently asked questions and provide contacts throughout the webinar for questions that might pop up later. Finally, if you have technical issues during the webinar, use the chat box and someone will attempt to help you resolve them. Otherwise, we hope the recording of this webinar and the email addresses we provide can get you back up to speed in the coming hours and days. So now for the reason that we are here, the reason we're doing the webinar tonight is simple, to prepare you to win better early voting plans for your county in the 2020 primary election. And as part, we'll briefly update you on the way COVID-19 is impacting our elections and election rule changes and court cases that have emerged as a result of the pandemic. We'll also lay out our broader strategy to protect and expand the right to vote in 2020 and build community influence, that's people power, that's you, over how local elections are run in the years to come. Now, through this webinar, you will understand at least Democracy North Carolina and SESJ's statewide strategy for early voting advocacy, understand the process for deciding early voting plans, and learn how to mobilize around specific action steps of the coming days and weeks for winning strong early voting plans in your county. And we'll lay out why early voting is so important to North Carolina in this year especially. And I don't think it's too hyperbolic to say as we face an unprecedented and uncertain pandemic, as historic numbers of voters head to the polls this fall, that in 2020, early voting options could help save lives. And we'll talk more about why early voting in particular is that important. So much is at stake in 2020, and we're so glad you're here for it. So let's start with a brief overview of what happened a week ago. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alyssa Ellis, for an overview of election rule changes. Alyssa? Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you all tonight to talk a little bit um, about early voting advocacy and about recent changes in our elections. So a week ago on June 11th, North Carolina lawmakers passed House Bill 1169, the only COVID related elections legislation to advance this session. Governor Cooper then signed the bill into law on June 12th. So House Bill 1169 takes some common sense steps to protect voters and expand access during this pandemic. And some of those things include elections funding. It provides matching state funds for federal grants. That includes federal funding from both the CARES Act and the Help America Vote Act, also known as HAVA. Um, this money will go to state and counties to expand early voting, buy personal protective equipment, rent bigger voting sites, and hopefully to provide incentive pay for poll workers and to process more absentee ballots. Both of these buckets of money come with some limitations and some reporting requirements by the State Board of Elections, which is important to note. Additionally, House Bill 1169 expands um, access to absentee voting. It provides new ways to request an absentee ballot request form, including um, the ability to call, email, or fax um, to get your request form. In addition, the State Board of Elections will be hosting a portal to allow absentee ballot requests. It also reduces mail-in voting witness requirements from two signatures to one signature and doesn't require a notary. In addition, it provides new procedures so that voters can track their ballots and election officials can track and process absentee ballots faster. And this includes absentee barcodes, which is a great addition. It also gives new authority to counties multipartisan assistance teams, also known as MAT teams, to help with voter requests. And very importantly, it provides support for in-person voting. It affords new flexibility to recruit poll workers countywide rather than within the same precinct, which is a big limitation that we had baked into our prior laws. The bill also unfortunately included a deceitful photo voter ID provision, a last minute attempt to revive the state's blocked law and to confuse voters in the process. We stood with many partners to oppose this. 
By now, the public is all too familiar with the fact that in recent years, multiple courts have stepped up to block multiple photo ID laws for their racially discriminatory intent or impact. Even with this on the books, voters currently do not need to present photo ID to vote. This should have been a clean bill that was strictly focused on the challenges imposed by the pandemic. But now our focus turns to the work ahead, educating voters about the critical rules, their options, and advancing even more reforms in the legislature. We're working to seek relief through the courts and fighting in every venue we can for a political process that's rid of the remnants of systemic racism that so many people are seeing. Every North Carolina voter deserves the best chance possible to stay safe and participate in the fast approaching 2020 elections and our democracy requires it. Unfortunately, there's not much guidance yet on the method and manner of implementation of many of House Bill 1169's provisions at the state and county levels. As a result, we will be making recommendations to both the state board and local boards on how to best administer elections with these new changes. We're going to have more on some of those recommend recommendations in a minute, but I'm going to turn it over now to Allison Riggs. Having me this evening, and I'm uh, really excited that you all are um, ready and um, raring to go to advocate for more early voting. Um, I want to let you know about an important piece of litigation that is pending. On May 22nd, as a result of legislative inaction, Democracy North Carolina, the League of Women Voters of North Carolina, and a number of individual voters sued the state um, seeking full and comprehensive relief um, in the conduct of the 2020 general election. House Bill 1169, as Alyssa mentioned, um, did some things to alleviate some of the burdens that COVID-19 is going to cause on voting, but I, I liken it to putting a Band-Aid over a gushing arterial wound. <laughs> we need to do much more, um, particularly to ensure Black and Brown voters um, who are bearing the brunt of the health impacts of the pandemic um, are, not choose, are not forced to choose between risking their health and casting their ballot. We have, um, in this litigation and more broadly, um, taken the, the posture that full COVID-19 election relief is, uh, requires us to look at voter registration, voting by mail and in-person voting and protecting each one of those. Um, we hope to be, we filed a motion for a preliminary injunction to seek additional relief even after um, House Bill 1169. In particular, in our lawsuit, we are seeking a later deadline for voter registration. We are seeking more online voter registration. We're seeking for this election to waive all of the witness requirements um, to ensure that um, people can um, vote, e vote on an absentee ballot by mail easily. Um, we are looking for um, processes for absentee ballots to be submitted in a manner other than by mail. So um, putting up drop boxes in multiple places across each county. Uh, that's what a lot of all vote by mail states do. Um, we want to include additional ways to request absentee ballots beyond e that which even um, 1169 uh, addresses. And importantly, we want to make sure that um, counties who are struggling financially have the ability to make early voting plans that make sense for them. Every county is um, facing a budget shortfall this year because of the fact that we shut down our economy for months. Um, so we get that, but your, the way your county makes budget decisions, um, if they undermine our democracy, it, it goes to the core of all accountability. So our position is that, that um, if anything gets cut, the last thing to get cut should be um, the elections in November and, or, or access to voting in November. And it may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but we think it's important to have more early voting sites than fewer early voting sites. Um, 
So we, yes, we expect absentee by mail voting to be up and we expect in-person voting to be down, but we know that we need to reduce the voter flow at each early voting site. That means more hours, more days, more sites. And that's currently prohibited by law right now. Um, so we need, in order to keep people safe while voting, um, we need to, to um, make early voting uh, easier for the counties. And then 1169 did something, uh, to, made some improvements on poll worker flexibility, but we need even more. Um, I'm sure many of you saw the chaos that was the Georgia primary last week. We're seeking relief that would um, allow the State Board of Elections to shift poll workers to wherever they can, wherever they're most needed um, and keep keep folks um, safe, keep polls open, and make sure that everyone can vote safely without um, risking their life. So we're hopeful that this lawsuit, like six other lawsuits pending right now to expand voting access this year, inside and outside of the pandemic, will be heard in the coming weeks and that we'll obtain more relief. All the more reason to um, pay attention uh, to information coming from Democracy North Carolina and SESJ um, to understand the changing rules. Next slide. So it's also um, important to understand the challenges that we face this year. Um, we're fighting in the legislature and the courts because not everyone wants North Carolina counties to have strong early voting plans. And it's not just about COVID-19. Since uh, 2013, when we lost Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the legislature has attempted to undermine um, early voting access. And early voting is, is popular um, with everyone. It is nice to have uh, flexibility on when you vote and to avoid um, long lines. But in 2016, um, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals struck down the legislature's attempt to cut early voting, um, noting that the, the law that was passed in 2013 was targeted African American voters with almost surgical precision. Um, but that wasn't enough. Uh, attacks on early voting didn't end then. We've seen everything from overtly partisan memos to county boards demanding party line cuts to early voting plans. That happened in 2016. To even more insidious uniform hours requirements law, a law passed in 2018 that significantly restricted resources available to host early voting. Um, when our com when our communities use it the most, so that 2018 bill it was a Senate bill. That 2018 law was Senate Bill 325, and it said if you have one early voting site open, you have to have them all open, and you have to have them open um, from like crazy hours, 7 a.m. to to way late when voters didn't vote. There were counties like Harnett County that chose because it, it knew how its voters preferred to vote to open additional sites on the weekend. It was cost effective. It enabled voters to vote when they wanted to vote. And this law prohibited them from doing it. The uniform hours requirement increased the number of hours provided for early voting, but they weren't hours that were used. And it reduced the number of sites significantly across the state um, and created an, an even a very significant financial burden on the on the counties. COVID-19 obviously is is affecting early voting as well. We like I said, there's you know we're feeling the economic hurt of closing down the economy. Um, county budgets are down, um, but we're we're urging county commissions right now, and we're telling county boards the same thing. If if the money is going anywhere, it needs to go to funding the election this year because we can't hold accountable our elected officials if we don't have a participatory and safe election. And then third um, is just this year's 11 House Bill 1169. It's the only COVID-19 uh, related election law that was passed. There were bills in the House and the Senate that would have done some of the things we, we're seeking a court to order in our litigation. So lifting the uniform voting hours um, and making absentee uh, processes easier this fall. Um, but they, lawmakers took the easy way out. Rather than taking this unprecedented challenge um, and meeting it with um, 
all of the resources available from the state. Uh, the, this was a compromise bill that did far too little to make sure that we can all participate and have a, um, an election that reflects the will of the people here in this, in this state. Back to Alyssa. So it's not all doom and gloom. You know, I think that's the whole reason we're here as advocates. All of these challenges are worth overcoming because early voting has been crucial to increasing voter turnout in North Carolina. And if we want more people to participate in elections, we have to use and expand early voting and reforms like same day registration, which is the ability to register and vote at the same time. And it is only available during early voting. Early voting is such a pivotal part of protecting and expanding the vote in the vote, especially amid the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and furthermore, early voting isn't just about convenience. There are many reasons why early voting is essential. First of all, early voting reduces long lines at the poll. North Carolina had added over a million voters to the rolls since 2008. High turnout among this population can stress polling places on election day, leading to problems inside and long waits for voters. If you have voted in North Carolina, you understand the pain of being in lines. Early voting is used by well over half of North Carolina voters who cast ballots, which relieves a lot of the stress on election day. Amid COVID-19 as well, reducing long lines will be especially important as voters attempt to physically distance and minimize contact with poll workers and others. We don't want to create community spread. Second, early voting means more opportunity for all voters. Many voters have a hard time or, can it, or cannot get off work for election day to vote. Early voting provides flexible hours, including evening and weekends, so people have more chances to cast a ballot. In addition, Saturday and Sunday have the highest early voting turnout rates per hour of any day, with Sunday actually being the highest and most favored day to vote. Voters can use any early voting site in their county instead of having to vote in a specified precinct, which reduces the use of provisional ballots. And during this time of COVID-19, more early voting options for working voters are especially important as voters attempt to avoid long lines and to apply social distancing. Third, early voting offers one-stop problem solving for voting issues. Voters who have moved recently can update their registration at an early, vo at an early voting site in their county. Eligible voters who registered at the DMV or somewhere else and show up to find that their name isn't on the rolls can register and vote during early voting. This is essential. And during COVID-19, voter registration numbers have plummeted. Combined with mass voter removals, voters will rely on same-day registration available only during early voting as a vital safety net to vote. And finally, early voting helps bring in new voters. New voters can register and vote on the same day during early voting. Same day registration has helped well over 400,000 people cast ballots during early voting, especially working class voters, poor voters, younger voters, and voters who face more barriers to engaging in the voting process. During COVID-19, we've seen, and as I mentioned, voter registration has plummeted. And so we really, really need to make sure that all new voters are able to vote. And I don't think I've ever said early voting that many times in a brief period of time, but I'm gonna turn it over to Sailor to talk about how we do it, how we win better early voting. Thanks, Alyssa, and thanks, Allison, too. Uh, if you're familiar with the old ditty by Montel Jordan, this is how we do it. This is the section where we talk about how we do it. How do we win these strong early voting plans that we've been talking about? Uh, and the, the necessity is clear. So to win, we have a three-step process that we use, uh, not simply in your county, but in the vast majority of counties across the state, and that is to have a goal, and make a plan like anything else, understanding how the decisions are made, the pressure points in our counties to make these changes, and then just merely show up and take action together, which is, uh, it sounds easy, but it's not. And especially in the age of COVID, we're gonna help you navigate that process. Um, so we, 
for the uh, 2020 primary, for example, uh, we prioritize pushing for strong early voting plans in a little over half of North Carolina counties, 54 counties. Um, that would not only account for the vast majority of voters in the state, but also we, where we needed to defend important weekend hours or campus polls and sites that serve underrepresented groups all of which are worth defending this year, I might add. But for the general election, we've added even more counties. We're focusing on 63 counties as of now, and you can find a sampling of our letters to those counties from SESJ and Democracy NC with research and suggestions from the experts that you're hearing from tonight at demnc.co slash evletters, and more counties are going to be added to that list all the time. So while we've narrowed our focus as to where we have capacity to support a broad campaign to win early voting plans, please know that all 100 North Carolina counties, which are probably represented on this webinar tonight, are currently creating early voting plans and deserve strong advocates like you. So regardless of where you live in this state, we highly recommend you organize in your county, and this is how we're gonna do it. So you've heard me say over and over and again, we're gonna push for good or better or robust early voting plans. And what we mean by good are plans that do four things, four broadly four things. Uh, one is convenient voting locations for young and student voters in the surrounding community. You may have heard that many students are being asked to report back to campus this fall just in time to vote. We need good early voting sites for those students, even if they're sheltering in their dorms or not uh, going to classes in person. We need robust weekend hours over the 17-day early voting period. As Alyssa pointed out, we need multiple Saturdays. And in a, over a quarter of North Carolina counties, we need Sunday voting too. Um, these are going to be incredibly important for working voters uh, during this particular election. We need good satellite voting locations that can serve historically underrepresented voters, including Black voters and other communities of color. And where possible in 2020, it's an unprecedented year, we need larger voting centers that will allow voters and poll workers to safely distance. At the same time as we're pushing for more access amid the COVID-19 crisis, we also want to remember that turnout in 2020 will be high. It's just the way of things in presidential elections. So in early voting advocacy, we always have to be mindful of the difference in election cycles, but this is a presidential year and we will need more. And I'll say more about that in just a minute. So how does it work? Uh, I said before that now is the time, and I want to stress the sense of urgency because right now early voting for the 2020 general begins in October with plans due to the State Board of Elections as soon as July 2020. That means a summer deadline that pushes the time frame for early voting advocacy up significantly. So we need for you to be ready to act as soon as this month and next month and possibly this week or next week. And so here's an example of how this works in a county where all of our typical asks come into play, the asks I just regaled for you a minute ago. In past presidential cycles, Cumberland County Demo democracy advocates have worked with local activists to use our three-step plan to win better plans. Remember the three steps are understand how the decisions are made, have a goal, make a plan, and then show up and take action together. So in 2018, working with members of our HKONJ coalition, the NAACP, Democracy NC, National Organization of Women, the Deltas, NCAE, you name it, that meant setting goals around four distinct asks in Cumberland County. So again, this is just an example of how this works. In Cumberland in 2018, we wanted to defend Sunday voting, again, defend weekend hours, find a new location to move from one particular site, Cliffdale, a site that has historically served Black voters, keep Smith Recreation Center open, a viable option for Fayetteville State students and other young voters, and get consistent hours at a Spring Lake location that would work for working voters. So that checks off all of our asks. And this meant tactics that include showing up and taking action together. 
uh, we were getting a sense about when the board would work its plan and make its plan and make sure the public was invited. We prepped talking points that allowed people to speak collectively for those particular asks. Made sure pastors were there and other influence makers who could speak on behalf of their congregations in support of Sunday voting. We provided speakers with data to support those asks. We had even an active duty military person, again, it's Cumberland County, go there to advocate for strong weekend hours working voters. And because of uh, the need for student voting at Fayetteville State University, we made sure to train the student body president to come and speak using the talking points in support of our goals. Other creative tactics included creating a short film to advocate specifically for Smith Rec. The students, believe it or not, did that. Uh, we filled uh, the Board of Elections meetings room every single time, so no actions took place in the darkness. And we identified a board member who would be willing to break any unanimous vote and petition the state board for an alternative or non-unanimous plan, including goal sites and hours. And I'll talk to you a little bit more more about that leverage point in a moment. But as we've said, there are more complications in 2020. Senate Bill 325, as Allison said, made a significant impact on what was possible in recent election cycles. For example, the inflexibility of early voting requirements made it difficult in Cumberland that year for the Board of Elections to maintain sites that had historically been used by underrepresented populations. Here is an example how losing flexibility hurts us. In 2018, the added weekday hours requirement that Allison talked about burdened counties to the tune of higher costs and resulted in fewer early voting sites for 43 of 100 counties. Remember, this is still in place. Further, two thirds of North Carolina's counties eliminated weekend hours due to the increased costs and the loss of local flexibility. In Cumberland County specifically, what did this look like? It looked like cutting three early voting sites, and those were East Regional Library, E.E. E. Miller, and Smith Rec. Remember, I brought up Smith Rec as an important site for students. So this means a lot, right? To have these uniform hours, these unusable hours draining things. And it really meant a lot to Black voters and their sites who are disproportionately used at Smith Rec and E.E. E. Miller, which were cut and also for students. So people mobilized and it made a huge difference. This is a, a petition from our friends at Common Cause. We did our own petition. And now advocates in the county know how to activate around a goal. And so we worked hard together to get Smith Rec as a site for the 2020 primary to protect that site for students. For the 2020 primary, it meant saving Smith Rec, saving a Fayetteville State site as our goal. And why does it matter? Um, why did it matter? Well, it mattered a great deal to the community and it showed a sign. Here's Myron Pitts, the editorial editor at the Fayetteville Observer, talking about why it was so important for Smith Rec to be retained. Why does it matter if Smith Rec was a lower turnout site? Why do we need to win it back? Well, in a lower turnout election like 2014, about 7,000 voters use one of these small precincts. But remember, in 2008, only 14,177 votes was the difference between one president winning North Carolina and another losing it, okay? So in short, it only takes a few thousand votes to swing an entire presidential election. Remember, we're a swing state. Even fewer votes inside the state's governor. Roy Cooper won by about 10,000 votes. So no pressure, friends, but every single site counts, especially in a presidential election, especially those serving such an incredibly large number of underrepresented voters. Remember, Smith Rec served 95% African-American voters. And these sites are worth defending. And that's why we're fighting for better early voting plans, my friends. So I just want to let you know, I, I, we are making decisions and we are making goals and we are bringing people together in a way that wins these sites that are so valuable. And so in any campaign, we have to map out who our targets are and how to influence them. 
and in organizing the word target is used to describe the people with the power to give you what you want. And so I'm gonna tell you who those people are right now. They are the decision makers. So who are they? Um, the targets you hear me talking about, well, let's just do a pop quiz about it. I wanna see if you know who the targets are. Who do you think um, decisions around early voting plan? Is it the A, appointed state elections board, B, the appointed county elections board, or C, the paid county election staff? And I'll give you a few seconds to figure it out. So is it the appointed state elections board? And I'll talk to you about how big that board is and who composes it in a moment. Or do you think it's the, uh, the county elections board? I'll tell you a little bit about them. Or do you think it's the paid staff? Who makes the decisions? And I'll give you a few seconds. Well, friends, if you said B, congratulations to you. It is the appointed county elections board. Early voting plans are often crafted by or with major input of the paid county election staff, but they must first get final approval and a vote by the appointed members of the county board. The vote at the county level must be unanimous to approve the plan. And if that unanimous vote doesn't happen, okay, if that doesn't happen, then any single board member can submit an alternative plan to the state board of elections, which has the final authority. So the county board of elections members are your main targets in your county, but state board of elections members, as well as the county staff are what we call secondary targets or people who have some influence on the primary targets, okay? So you're gonna focus on the county BOE members. They're the people with the power to give you what you want. Your secondary targets are the county staff and state board, the people who can influence your primary targets. Now, because the county board of elections members are your primary targets, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the board structure because this can be new to people, especially since it's changed a ton in only the last four years since the last presidential election. In, tw in 2020, every county board has five members. Now that's different than it was a few years ago, but there are two Republicans and three Democrats, the majority being from the party of the governor. Under this structure, all 100 county boards have a Democratic chair, okay? At least in 2020. Chair has the authority to call the meetings, set the agenda, and lead the meetings. They're incredibly important. In other words, they control the key parts of the decision-making process. Now, I'm telling you all of this not to focus on the partisan nature of the boards, but to emphasize that these are people. When we're organizing to influence or pressure targets, we need to view each member as a potential early voting champion. They could be. So for this campaign, we're targeting the Board of Elections members, not the board as an entity. We need to know what board members care about and what board members we can count on. Which board members support our ideas, our goals of what make a good early voting plan and which ones don't. And we need to get support from all the members to get our unanimous vote. And, and we need to know if any of the five members would be willing to block a bad plan as they were in Cumberland, a plan with things like a reduction of weekend hours or something that kills important sites for our community. We've got to prevent a unanimous vote and then submit a better plan to the state board, also known as a non-unanimous or alternative plan. So you can see your structure here. We have to find our champions in that board structure. Now, this non-unanimous plan is an important leverage point. But I want to share one last thing about structure. The new structure has five state board of elections members as well. Remember, the primary targets are the county, but the state board has five members as well, with the majority also being from the party of the governor. And votes on early voting plans at the state board level are made by the majority of the members present. So recap, the county's paid staff helps craft the plan but the primary target is a unanimous early voting plan passed by the five member county board. But if the five member county board is going to pass a bad plan, 
one, one single early voting champion can file an alternative plan, a non-unanimous plan to be considered by the State Board of Elections, as you see on your screen right now. They don't actually look quite, which has the final say, okay? So clear as mud, good. Type any questions into the chat box, even now. But it's time for the final step, okay? You understand where the pressure points are, you understand what your goals need to be, at least broadly, it's time for the final step to show up and take action together. The together part is the key. The simple action plan on a tight timeline is to find out when your county board of elections will meet and what's on the agenda. Okay, this is key. Call ahead to confirm the meeting times and any virtual possibilities in the new COVID era and invite a friend to join you. It's so helpful with a buddy. It's just like going to the gym. Ask staff if there's a preliminary early voting plan being discussed and that you wanna see it. They should share it with you. And in the COVID-19 world, find out if the county will provide public comment opportunities either via a virtual or in-person meeting because not everybody is going to want to go to these meetings the county board should provide those folks who are at risk for COVID the ability to listen in and comment as well. Now, we want you to gather intelligence. Contact one of the members of your county board or the executive director or another staff member with whom you have or can have the best relationship. And remember, early voting advocacy is a year-round sport. Ideally, we get to know board members by attending meetings when early voting is being discussed and when it's not. So gather your intelligence from, from friends, find out what preliminary plans exist for the voting sites, ask them questions about what is the schedule and process for making a decision, ask them what they consider or support opening some early voting sites on a Sunday, what would persuade them to open sites for Saturday hours and or on a Sunday. Remember in the 2020 primary, we had great success with winning new Sunday options in many counties across the state. We need for you to organize, friends. Share intelligence with your allies, civic groups, supporters, people who are working with you. Ask them what they think about the preliminary plan and ask yourself that question. And if you don't know, look at previous plans and think about what you'd like to see for a good plan this year. Things like locations with good access for underrepresented voters, think students, voters of color, rural voters, and with good weekend hours for working voters. And I want you to follow the process. Find your targets. Recruit people to speak at these meetings. I mean, this is incredibly important. Organize a diverse group to go with you. For example, take faith or campus leaders like they did in Cumberland County to push for Sunday voting or for a site on or near campus and pack the house to show how important this is, not simply to you, but to your entire community. And coming back to the point I made briefly before about early voting and election cycles, it's important not to advocate too much so you wanna hone your tactics. You wanna, you wanna not ask for more than your county can pay for, but that's within reason for a presidential cycle. So we want you to pack these meetings, meet with BOE members, invite and talk to media, and use social media to get folks there too. Great tactics. Don't overdo it though. Use your prior plans, intelligence and allies to figure out what early voting sites and hours will actually be used. All right. So we're following a process. County boards of elections are required to announce their meetings ahead of time and their agenda, including any discussion or vote regarding the early voting plan. They should do this. And when you call them, you should ask them about it. The discussion and the vote should be held in a public meeting. This is so important. So keep showing up, or in the case of the COVID pandemic, listening in and speaking up. Ask the staff to include you on the email or media list for notices of all meetings. Let them email you, but don't stop calling. And by the time of the vote, you should have a sense of what will happen based on the intelligence you've gathered from the staff and from your allies in the community and from prior plans. So stick with it until the end. If your county plan goes to the State Board of Elections, remember a non-unanimous plan could get it there, plan to follow that process too, and we can help. Finally, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about reporting back. We have a Google reporting form that we ask you to fill out after interactions with Board of Elections staff 
or board members or attendance at BOE meetings. The more we know about what's happening, and by we, I mean Democracy North Carolina and Southern Coalition for Social Justice, the better strategic advice we can give you and support you on the ground. We want communication to be a two-way street, my friends. We'll send you information and we need you to send us information too. So you can find all of that at demnc.co slash EV advocacy. And right now I wanna turn it over to Alyssa for an important point about the impact of COVID-19 on this type of advocacy. Alyssa? So as we've heard and as I've mentioned, you know, COVID-19 isn't making it any easier to vote and it's not making it any easier to advocate. We've already sent letters to numerous counties requesting that they provide the community advance notice about their meetings, provide folks a way to join their meetings remotely and to give public comment, and finally to provide minutes or recordings of their meetings to the public. This year we've already seen some issues at the local level. Small in-person meetings or cancellations, virtual meetings sometimes requiring higher speed internet and no dial-in options, and sometimes new rules attached to public comment that make it harder for the public to have their voice heard. No one knows what the future will hold, but I think we can all agree all public county board of elections meetings should be open and accessible to the public and for comment. So if your County Board of Elections tells you that they are not offering a virtual meeting option, please, first of all, of course, tell them that they should organize with other advocates and encourage them to tell the County Board of Elections that they need to provide a virtual meeting option. And please let us at Democracy NC and Southern Coalition for Social Justice know if they do not offer or will not offer a virtual meeting option. Our reporting form includes an area for pre-meeting intelligence. Let our experts know if and when your county denies meeting notices, or you can also email us directly at elections at democracync.org. And with that said, we have seen public persistence result in counties taking up technology to facilitate public participation and input. Like early voting advocacy, every ask helps. So I'm gonna turn it over to Allison to talk a little bit about ways that Democracy North Carolina and Southern Coalition for Social Justice can help. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, Alyssa mentioned letters that we're sending to our target counties. Those are all gonna be posted on SCSJ's website and I think Dem Democracy North Carolina's website as well. Um, there's a lot of maps and charts and data in those letters. We'd be happy to um, walk you through how to use that data effectively in your advocacy. Something else that, that we're happy to share with you is the intel that we develop. We're not only sending letters to um, County Board of Elections officials and members, but we're talking to them. And so we can give you intel on who we think might be the obstructionist, if there is one, or who is a strong ally. Um, and you can support the strong allies and um, uh, really offer pointed advocacy towards folks who might be holding up the process. Um, we're also happy to connect advocates um, within each county with each other. Uh, that's particularly in um, Dem NC's wheelhouse. So you can always uh, email Democracy North Carolina's election advocacy team um, at the web at the email listed below. And really, you can help us issue spot and um, uh, we can work, work through problems with you and, and work to problem solve them. Thanks, Allison. Uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, it's especially important, um, as Alyssa said, to take in consideration, we actually have to advocate this year in the era of COVID to be able to advocate for better early voting. So I appreciate uh, those comments as well. But I want to emphasize that we can do this, y'all. We can do it. We've had tremendous success with this type of concerted early voting advocacy in the past. I mean, sometimes against insurmountable odds, we have successfully defended county Sunday voting options in 2016. And we garnered record numbers of Sunday options in the 2020 primary. I think 27 counties offered Sunday voting a new record. We also helped defend campus sites and increase weekend options despite 
numerous pressures created by the burdensome uniform weekday hours requirements that are constraining a lot of our counties this year. So when you're feeling dejected, uh, I just want you to remember the lessons from 2016 in Guilford County. I know many of you are from Guilford County. I show this picture all the time when 300 people were working together on a shared goal, packed their board of elections in Guilford County, marching past the Woolworths, the Civil Rights Museum, to push back against partisan attempts to limit early voting options. It worked that day and it set into motion a movement in that presidential election year that touched over 70 counties that packed their own meetings and did the same thing. And Guilford made sure that nothing bad was passed in the darkness and more importantly, that nothing bad passed at all. So good early voting plans can be one packed meeting room away. So let's talk next steps. After this webinar, you're going to get a follow-up email with a link to a recording of this webinar, a PDF of the slide deck. It'll also include a link to our EV Advocacy Hub. Okay, so we're gonna send you stuff. And a list of Dem C's organizers by region with their contact information. We're gonna connect with others. Either you're gonna do it, or we can help in your county to help you make a plan, review prior plans, and let us know if you need help connecting with others in your county. As Alice and Alyssa said, we may know some folks who are already taking action. I said at the beginning of this webinar tonight, Democracy NC has selected 63 counties where we'll be supporting early voting campaigns. If your county is among them, we will do our best to keep you updated and connected to the campaign via email communication. They will also be listed in the events section of our website, that, that, that URL there. But regardless, we hope you'll self-organize using the resources we provided tonight and we'll provide to you after this webinar. I really want to emphasize that you can do this. We provide tools, research, and support, but this is our democracy and these are your communities. We want you to take the lead. So attend these meetings. Many of these meetings, we're gonna email you. If you're not signed up for our email alerts, I know most of you are, here's how you do it. Many of those meetings will be on our event page, but to find your county, also visit our Early Voting Advocacy Hub. It's demnc.co slash evadvocacy. Because we're gonna stay in touch with more tools and tips and it's gonna be great. We're gonna keep you abreast all the time. So this is our Early Voting Advocacy Hub. Just a reminder, it's got five steps. One of them is registering for this webinar. You check that off. You got four more steps to do. And uh, before we open it up for a Q&A, a short Q&A, and again, we're gonna send you an FAQ, so don't worry if your question doesn't get answered. Um, I wanna give you where all the training materials will be. They'll be at the hub, just give me a few hours. Um, but this is the URL where they can be now. Uh, there's starter materials there. It's demnc.co slash your EV training. So there are a million ways you're gonna get this stuff. We're gonna email you. You could write down this URL now. You could go to our EV Advocacy Hub um, and, and find it all. So I want uh, uh, Taylor and Caroline, feel free to chime in. If there are some frequently asked questions you'd like to put to the experts or answer yourself. Um, we've got about five minutes left. And so I'd like to take some of the most frequently asked questions and, and just know we will mail you, email you uh, answers to many other questions after the webinar. Great, I have a list. So um, the first one that I'll say is, a lot of people are asking for clarifications on why the Board of Elections are vague about their early voting plans or when they're gonna be talking about them or why they have meetings at not ideal times or maybe don't allow public comment. That's a great question and I kind of like to put it to our experts, Alyssa and Allison, to talk a little bit about um, what some of those reasons are and uh, what we're doing to overcome it. Yeah, I know that this is Alyssa. I know that Allison is gonna hop off as a 
busy litigator with a lot on her plate. Um, so, you know, I think it's a challenge right now, particularly in the time of COVID um, for counties who are chronically underfunded, whose boards of elections are underfunded to have the technology, to have practice with the technology and to be comfortable with that. Um, you know, I think one of the important things to note is that it's not just unique to county boards of elections. Some of these transparency questions, um, a lot of other municipal bodies like city councils are, are, you know, being challenged by the present time. I think additionally, too, you know, what may be convenient for the county board of election to meet during, you know, work hours might not be convenient for other folks. And so one thing that Democracy North Carolina is very committed to is diversifying, you know, election staffing, whether it's poll workers or even folks who are working with the county board of election, so that people, you know, who have different access needs can have that feedback too and actually be in a position of power. Um, so your advocacy is really, really important. Um, and so I think, you know, as we go into this very, very busy summer, as Sailor mentioned, we're on a short timeline, I think it's really, really important to establish relationships with these counties so you can find out their reasons and rationales for holding meetings the way that they do. Thanks, Alyssa. That was great. And I, I want to emphasize, uh, you know, everybody is working as hard as they can, or we hope so. And uh, giving people grace in this moment is great. But our job is to uh, fight for good early voting options. And as Alyssa mentioned, um, it may not always be convenient for you. And that is why we are working in coalition and working together. Because if you can't make a Tuesday at 10 a.m. meeting, I bet you know someone who can. And they're going to be your buddy throughout this process. Taylor, are there any more good questions that have bubbled up uh, in the hour? Yes. Um, I know. I think this is coming up for a lot of people recently because Kamala Harris uh, spoke on like drive through voting recently. Um, and so a lot of people are asking about expanding curbside voting, but there are a lot of difficulties with that. So maybe we could quickly speak on that. Yeah, uh, I actually received an email about this today and uh, it was a good news, bad news response, right? Uh, you know, the, the bad news is nothing in House Bill 1169 specifically mentioned drive-through voting. The good news is we have great curbside voting here in the state, but I want to hand it over to Alyssa and some of our other experts to talk a little bit more about how we're trying to make it a little bit easier for folks who are at risk not to even have to go inside at all. Definitely, that's a really good question. Um, so as Sailor mentioned, and as Allison has mentioned, you know, HB 1169 left a lot on the table. And one of those things is drive-through voting. And so we do have curbside voting, which is absolutely essential for many, many voters in North Carolina. And one of the things that curbside voting is challenged with, um, just like other, you know, types of voting is long lines. Um, you know, curbside voting requires a space for the cars to travel through. It requires staffing. It requires signage. And so we've been really, really diligent um, through our poll monitoring program to collect information about how curbside is and isn't working. Um, and a plug for a report that'll be forthcoming around um, what we saw in the 2020 primary this March. But really, you know, we have a list of recommendations, not only for the State Board of Elections, but for counties on how they can make curbside voting the best possible option for folks who are unable to get out of the car. I um, mean, one thing that is to note is that, you know, you don't need a doctor's note for curbside voting or anything like that. Um, and if you have really detailed questions about curbside voting, you can call 888-R-VOTE um, to speak with Caroline, who's been in the chat. Um, and we can give you a little bit more information, but we're advocating to make that a really safe and accessible option for all North Carolinians for the general election. Thank you, Alyssa. And uh, an incredible point um, mentioning plugging our uh, election protection program. That'll be the next webinar you see is recruiting for, to be a poll monitor this year, but it's also so important that your counties have good poll workers as well, because the poll workers are the ones who are actually administering curbside voting, making sure they come out and in and check to see if people are waiting and checking to see if the lines are long. They need good poll workers. And many of you, I hope, will apply to be poll workers in your county as well. In addition to being poll monitors, who make sure that if uh, voters are not getting what they need to vote, 
um, there are experts waiting to help. I think we have one, time for one last question before uh, uh, we turn it over to uh, elections at Democracy NC or our hotline to take your questions or the FAQ. Taylor, is there a, a quick question we could answer? Yeah, this is more of a reminder. So people are worried about um, the voter roll purge from last year, as well as um, just some other reasons why people may not be registered and then might possibly try to vote by mail without checking. So in the chat box, I've been reminding people how they should check their registration and then try to register to vote online. Um, but I was wondering if you could spend just a little bit of time on it. Yeah, uh, I'm campaigns director and uh, Taylor and I are working together uh, with Alyssa and many of our colleagues at Democracy NC to make sure that everybody knows that for the first time they can uh, not simply vote from home, but also register to vote from home. And that people, because of that uh, 570,000 plus removal in 2019, may think they're registered to vote and ready to go for fall and are not. We'll be working together with other coalition partners to make sure every voter who uh, has been removed from the rolls, or at least will attempt to, knows to check their status, uh, which you can do at ncvoter.org right now. You can share ncvoter.org right now with as many friends as you have. Make sure they understand that they may have been removed from the rolls. They can check their status at demnc.co slash lookup. And um, then if they are not registered to vote, safely registered to vote from home uh, using online voter registration, the details of which are also at ncvoter.org if they have a DMV ID. Now, uh, we're gonna try to get as many people registered to vote and as many people going to the polls as possible. But remember, one of the best solutions for people who are not registered to vote is the problem solver called early voting, the 17 days where you can register and vote at the same time. Yes, friends, by winning good early voting options in your county, you are solving the problem of many people being removed from the rolls because you are giving them the option to correct those problems, register and vote at the same time. So we are so glad you were here with us tonight. Remember, if your question was not answered tonight, we will send you an FAQ with responses. We will also send you a helpful toolkit that may answer your questions if we couldn't answer them tonight. If you have more questions, we are not ghosting you. Uh, you can always email us at elections at democracync.org or call 888-R-VOTE. That's our election hotline. Caroline, is standing by a lot of the time, poor Caroline, uh, to take your elections calls. And I will let you know that we have great volunteers working on the ground even now with our tremendous regional organizers. May, Adrian, Marquez, Edward, Kamaria, Linda, and Manny are ready to help you plug into the local work on the ground in early voting and beyond. You will receive this slide with their contact information. Feel free to reach out to them as well. And so finally, I wanna say all of the materials from tonight's training, we're just a little over tonight, are at demnc.co slash your EV training. That's your EV training. And I really appreciate it. We're gonna have a recording and audio and chat and toolkit and the presentation slides are gonna be there as well. It's a cornucopia of fun, my friends, and we really appreciate you fighting so hard for early voting options. Thank you for coming to winning better early voting plans in 2020. Look for emails from us soon and have a great day.